hadn't seen savagery to, uh, done to a child or even an adult until uh, the doctor peeled back her scalp and uh, saw that hor horrific uh, fracture to her head. It was the length of her head. It was eight and a half inches long, and there was something else even more disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 20 in the ongoing series on John Bonet Ramsey. This is not an episode if you're squeamish, so be warned. We are going to return to this interview from Linda Oren, just the next part of what she was saying uh, in the part that is in the uh, Patreon uh, segment of this of this episode. So what we're going to go through in this particular uh, segment is basically we're going to look at the version that John Ramsey gives when he finds John Bonet. You could argue it's quote unquote finds or maybe he did really find her. He didn't know that she was there. And then we're actually going to go into once again at least three other narratives we're going to go into Steve Thomas talking about this particular aspect um, more in terms of the the coroner and the sort of negotiation you could also call it blackmail or coercion or whatever around um, the custody of John Bonet's body we're also going to go back to perfect murder perfect town and just get Schiller's account of the 911 call and the aftermath, right? Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed, please do like, share, leave a comment. Thanks also to the 100 people or so that have subscribed since the last video. And uh, let's get started. So I'm going to be quoting little excerpts from The Death of Innocence, page 22 which is where John Ramsey narrates and he talks about going downstairs with Fleet White, okay? And what is interesting is in this particular section, he talks about things going into a blur. It's the same thing that he says as he introduces the chapter talking about sort of the afternoon, the events of that afternoon. And I don't know if you remember in the uh, Jody Arias case, she also talked about a fog. And, um, you know, I guess you could sort of say s certain people have different experiences, but often in emergency situations where there's a heightened sense of emotion, you remember things quite viscerally. I know that um, when I was in a car accident, I remember things uh, very, very, very clearly, even many years later. So John talks about heading downstairs uh, he takes Fleet over to the broken window pane and he explains that he broke in there last summer. And he tells him that I found this window open earlier. Now, I find this very interesting that John tells Fleet this, but did he tell the police? Did Linda Orrent know at that point about this broken window? And it, it's another sort of unclear aspect in terms of the Ramsey case when was this thing about the broken window um, communicated to anybody? Then, uh, then they conduct kind of the only investigation in situ. They both sort of look around for glass splinters and find a few small ones. Now, you've got to kind of also wonder why. Why are you looking for glass splinters if the window was broken a long time kind of previously? Then they continue their search. And a few minutes later, he's at the door by the furnace. Now, what's quite interesting is he doesn't refer to it as the wine cellar door. He sort of gives it a nondescript sort of name. He says, I open it and see John Bonet lying on the floor with a white blanket around her. Now, once again, you've kind of got to wonder, is he suffering from amnesia? Um, doesn't he remember sort of turning the latch? And also, doesn't he remember turning on the light? Because he had to have done that to see John Bonet. He also doesn't mention that he would need to step into the room and sort of move forward and look slightly to the left, to the one side, to see John Bonet lying, not directly in front of him, 
but to the side. And then he, he talks about a white blanket around her. He doesn't mention that it's her white blanket. That is, in fact, her favorite blanket. And it's probably a blanket that was fairly freshly laundered, right? That is what the housekeeper said, that that is where she put the, the, that blanket. He also t mentions black tape covers her mouth. Um, he doesn't really say it's black duct tape, although I guess that's maybe nitpicking a little bit. Black tape covers her mouth. He doesn't, um, he doesn't sort of say that he sees John Bonet and um, realizes she's dead or thinks that she might be alive. That's not mentioned. So the first thing he mentions is a white blanket. Then he mentions the black duct tape, both of which are totally irrelevant to kind of what happened to her. Then he uses italics and says, that's my baby lying there like that. And um, then he goes on to say, her hands are above her head. This is kind of somewhat useful and tied together with a shoestring like cord. That's not accurate either. It's not a shoestring. He doesn't indicate that it's white. It's actually kind of a nylon cord. And there's been some discussion about this. I investigated it in detail in the books that I've written. It is very likely a kind of cord associated with um, with camping, the kind of cord that you use to, um, if you erecting a tent. So that kind of kind of waterproof uh, poly something. I'm not quite sure what kind of material it is. I used to know that you use to kind of lash a tent to the ground. Right, it's the same kind of material, and there is talk about, um, I think, uh, shopping receipts with these kind of things on there. So, kind of to 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 cut to the chase, it's the kind of thing associated with camping, something that a boy scout might be using. It it's also something that you would think about in terms of sailing to some extent, although I don't think it's the same kind of rope material. But what is interesting was the 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 knots around um, her wrist and also around a garrote, which we'll get to later on. A wooden garrote that had um, paint sort of removed and it appeared to be sort of whittled. Her hands are above her head, tied together. Um, actually, they aren't really tied together. Certainly, when you when she was seen on the floor. The one, um, the, the one hand was sort of tied. When, you, when he says tied, that's not really accurate. There was sort of a, a loose ligature, so loose that he was able to just brush it off when he, he picked her up. So it, it was almost like a faux um, restraint, if I can put it that way. Almost like when, you know, if you think about People on Valentine's Day, uh, someone might have a gag on their mouth or have their arm tied to the bed railing, but with a handkerchief, it's not necessarily something that they can't get out of. It, and, and that I'm just saying that there seemed to be a playful element to that aspect. And um, then he goes on to say, my heart leaps and a rush runs through my body. And he says, I found her. Thank God I found her. And so John's emphasizing here that this joy that, wow, you know, the whole morning has gone by. He's had no idea where John Bonet is. Now he's found and he's happy. And um, I must say, personally, I find the way that he describes this utterly unconvincing. I'll tell you why. In subsequent interviews, John's also talks about um, that, that he sort of felt relief. That's the word he used. He felt relief to see John Bonet. I just don't think that... And this is just me. I just don't think that a lot of parents in that situation, that would be their first impulse. I think their first impulse would be panic, fear, anxiety, uh, absolute terror, in fact. You know, what? Th this is not good. This is not a good, well, I wouldn't say not a good look. It's not a good scenario. Um, John Bonet is not safe. John Bonet is not conscious. John Bonet is not moving. John Bonet doesn't seem to be breathing. And he doesn't even check that. He doesn't check for a pulse. He doesn't check for signs of life. Where he talks about the black duct tape and the, um, uh, what do you call it, the 
the, the, the blanket. He doesn't say anything about John Bonet herself. You know, d does she look alive? That would be the first thing you would sort of want to know. Um, is she moving? Is she breathing? Is she flushed? Is she, is she pale? And only after all of this does he say, um, I fall down over her body. So, so you could, if you're cynical or if you analyzing it from a particular perspective, you could say, well, the reason for that is X, Y, Z. Um, because you can imagine if he, John knew that John Bonet had died, there would not really, really be a reason to do that. Same with Patsy, and that's the same thing Patsy does. She also, as soon as um, the body is upstairs, she falls over the body and, you know, obviously places whatever she's wearing over the body. And in, that's obviously witnessed by people all around them. Um, anyway, he says, I instantly ripped the tape off her mouth, begging her to talk to me. Um, Yeri doesn't actually quote himself. He doesn't say that he says, John Bonet, John Bonet. I don't really know whether he means that he literally begs her to talk to him, meaning with words. I don't know whether he sort of is, is kind of meaning, well, I hoped she would talk to me. But I kind of get the sense that it's um, non-verbal what's going on. Uh, he goes on to say, I pull the blanket off her. He says, her delicate eyelids are closed and her skin is cool to the touch. So he's kind of left the, the um, I don't know if you want to call it the assumption or the, the inference that John Bonet is dead right till the end. And I don't know, it, I think most people in that situation would put that right at the beginning, that it didn't look like she was alive. That would be the first thing you'd notice. That would be the first thing you would sort of, um, be trying to assess not what she's wearing not um, how her hands are tied and not noticing shoe shoe strings or whatever um, the other thing is he says her skin is cool to the touch I don't think that is accurate either I'll tell you why John Monet's in the basement in a dark corner of the basement on the ground on a cement floor it's the middle of winter it's one of the coldest days in Boulder that year. Obviously, heat rises and cold air sinks. So on the floor, on that cement floor, um, John Bonet was likely to be ice cold to the touch. Very, very cold, possibly even slightly blue. And uh, he says that her skin is cool. I don't think it was cool. I think it was cold. Cold in a way that would give you, make you shudder. That th this person... And anyway, the, uh, the other thing to, I, I guess, emphasize is if you're going to say someone is cool to the touch, it suggests they may have died very recently. Like, um, you know, in, in, in this case, you could say, well, if, jo if John Bonet was only cool to the touch at this point, well, then maybe she died just earlier that morning, like um, at, I don't know, um, five o'clock that morning or something like that. And I don't think that is the case. I think... John Bonet died uh, closer to midnight, and that is part of the um, the ambit of what we're going to assess in this episode is the time of death. I think on John Bonet's grave, her date of death is put as December twenty fifth, nineteen ninety six, but it's possible that she actually died in the very early hours of December twenty sixth especially based on the screams that were heard. And this is quite, um, this is a very important aspect, is to know what her time of death was, and the coroner could have provided some clarity on this. Also, if John Bonet's body had been reported or found earlier, you would have known better what the time of death was. And if you did know the exact time of death, that is when you can start talking about alibis. Where were you at this time? Who were you with at this time? Where were you in the house at this time? Kind of thing. So moments after he says that I her skin is cool, he doesn't say anything about whether she shows, sh she shows signs of life or not. He says, I can't stand the sight of her hands tied and have to do something to get them loose. And so here he contaminates the, the binding around her one hand and he just basically brushes it and the binding comes off. 
And so this is essentially contaminating whoever it was that made this particular binding, theoretically. He says, I start untying her, but I can't get the tight knot undone. I don't know if that is uh, accurate because the he does get the one undone unless it was undone to begin with. And the other one isn't really tight. It doesn't look tight. In fact, it is tied over his sleeve. It really doesn't look very tight at all. And then he says, um, you know, that I can't get the tight knot undone. Now, um, I don't know whether he was aware of this. I don't know whether anyone was actually aware of this. It's possible that someone was. But even, um, you know, even if you had to look at John Bonet, the, the ligature was so tight around her neck that, that it had almost, in other words, it bit into the skin of her neck so tightly that you almost didn't see it. Okay? And so you can imagine that if whatever happened to John Bonet happened in the dark and someone was pulling this ligature and it went so far into her neck that you couldn't actually see the ligature anymore, you might not know what was going on. In other words, you might not know whether it was working or where it was or whatever. The other aspect was if you'd pulled the ligature and you'd sort of felt, or the garrote, and you'd felt, oh no, I didn't mean to do that. It would be very difficult to undo it. It would be very difficult to find a way to get some sharp object like a knife or some cutting instrument to uh, remove it. And I'm talking about if the garrote was used either in error or by accident, and now you want to undo it, you would have difficulty doing it given how effective it ultimately was. So he goes on to say, everything begins to blur. And I kind of have a problem with that. Um, it's possible that he's suffering trauma. It's possible that he doesn't remember. But it just seems unlikely that when he finds John Bonet the next minute, he can't seem to remember what happens. And I'm not sure whether Fleet White had the same experience. He says, I'm slipping out of my mind and losing control. Um, it would be quite simple to know what to do at that point, and that would be to call Detective Oren. She's asked him to see if he finds anything, and now they've found something. All he would need to do is either tell Fleet White to go and call her, or to go and call her himself. The other thing is, he, if he felt that she might be alive, well, call 911. Uh, if she, he felt that she was cool to the touch and she might be still alive, well, call 911. But yet he seems, um, well, either certain that she's not alive or just totally uncertain about everything. Fleet White, on the other hand, is quite, quite a lot more assertive, as we'll see in a moment. So he says, um, I grab John Bonet under her arms and pick her up. This is just after he said, I'm slipping out of my mind. So he's kind of saying that he does this in a moment of irrationality. Then he stumbles out of the room and he says, I run to the stairs carrying my still child. So at no point now does he acknowledge Fleet. Fleet's right there when he finds her. Um, he doesn't say where Fleet is. He doesn't say what Fleet does. He doesn't, say, he doesn't say anything to Fleet. Fleet doesn't say anything. Bear in mind they've just discovered a body. And there's absolutely no acknowledgement of what Fleet does or... Um, you know, there's no, no interaction either way in, in terms of this narrative. So then he, um, he says, he carries my still child. And he says, from somewhere far inside of me, a scream erupts. As far as I remember, um, as far as I recall, this is what I'm saying. I don't think other people heard John screaming. I'm talking about, I don't think Fleet said that John screamed. And I don't think Detective Orant reported that he screamed and there were other people there as well i don't remember that 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 came up at all so anyway he says from somewhere far inside of me a scream erupts and wh one thing that i find d definitely interesting in this respect is i seem to again i could be wrong on this but i seem to remember that fleet white kind of came up the stairs shouting and that would obviously be the behavior of an innocent adult in that situation he's going into emergency mode he wants to do things in a time critical urgent manner 
and so he's shouting and um, you know one of the things that didn't happen in the story is apparently when Patsy found the ransom note she never called out for John Bonet's name and even though she called out for John Burke apparently remained asleep and so that, that's the part that just doesn't quite um, sound or feel right then he says that's all I can do I scream like I'm in a nightmare but my body is still asleep I'm deathly afraid I don't know whether that all means he's kind of screaming inside of himself is it's like a it's a kind of an inaudible scream inside of his body or something like that then he says I run to the living room where Linda Arndt is standing and lay John Bonet on the floor in front of the Christmas tree that's also not what Linda Arndt says she said he she had to tell him to put John Bonet down and then apparently Linda put John Bonet on the floor in front of the Christmas tree he says I still believe we can do something so what he's trying to convey here is that he thinks John Bonet is still alive yet he's done nothing at this point such as CPR he hasn't checked her breathing hasn't checked her pulse it's almost like he's waiting for a cue from someone else what should I do uh, could she be alive do you want to check whether she's alive um, kind of thing then he says we've got to get her awake and out of this unconscious state so right at this point after carrying her upstairs he's thinking Oh, she's unconscious he's realized she's unconscious in front of Linda Arendt it's like he's realized oh she's unconscious um, sh she's not awake and it, what's interesting is he talks about himself I'm in a nightmare and my body is still asleep which is similar to what Chris Watts said on the sermon on the porch he said it's like I'm in a nightmare that I can't wake up from remember in italics he says we've got to get her awake and out of this unconscious state breathing moving talking anything now this is kind of a clever little device he's saying in this narrative that's what he's thinking that's what he was saying that was that was what he was communicating and of course it wasn't he, he didn't say to Linda Arndt we've got to get her awake he basically just bent over her and um, so did Linda Arndt and Linda Arndt within moments knew that John Bonet wasn't alive. Let's listen to that. And John Bonet was clearly dead. Then she's been dead for a while. I ordered him to put John Bonet down. I knelt next to her and I leaned down to her face. And he asked if she was dead. And I said, yes, she's dead. And I told him to go back to the room and to dial 911. So if um, John really thought that his daughter was still alive, what he does next doesn't really make a lot of sense. He says, all I can do is comfort John Bonet, hug her and kiss her. Now if someone is needing CPR, uh, needing to be revived, none of that is going to do any good. The other thing just to reiterate from what uh, Linda Arendt was saying is, you know, when you kind of dig into the case a little bit deeper it turns out that when John was carrying John Bonet up the stairs her, her arms were sort of rigid in front of her right they were sort of suspended in front of her like kind of like a doll um, stiff and he was holding her kind of at a sort of a distance from himself he, he had his hands extended he, he wasn't carrying her like all over his, his shoulder um, he was sort of holding her almost as if she smelled or, or um, I don't know, it's difficult to say what he was trying to do. But, you know, just in terms of that, it was obvious that she wasn't going to be revived and that she was far from life. You know, all signs of life had left her. And he goes on to say, I've found my baby. And then he says, abruptly officer Orant is down beside me checking John Bonet's vital signs so the detective has got to check whether his daughter's alive because he doesn't know because he's not going to check the policewoman straightens up looks at me in the eye and tells me John Bonet is dead the shock is overwhelming he says I can't cry so, so John is shocked he, there's no he, he didn't see this coming he had no idea that this was the case and he can't even cry Right? He's felt this relief that he's found her, but now that he knows what's going on, 
Now he doesn't seem to have any emotions. You know, the pain he says is too deep for that. He says the pain is too deep to be shocked enough to cry or whatever. He says I'm not sure what is going on around me, and so it's more blurring kind of going on. And he says he's drowning in excruciating pain. Um, I don't want to sort of um, I don't want to be dismissive and say that John felt absolutely no emotion. I'm sure he felt a lot of emotion at that point. I'm sure he felt feelings of fear and uh, anxiety. And I think there were certainly feelings of loss. But I think there was a lot of conflicting feelings raging around in him at the same time. The, the question is, was he giving priority to the right feelings? Was he worrying about the right things? Was he worrying about the things an innocent person would be worrying about? Maybe. Maybe people grieve dif differently. Then he says in italics, Patsy will be coming into the room, I think. He goes on to say, her friends have kept her in the TV room. And um, so she's, Patsy's in a different room. And John says, well, um, Patsy mustn't see John Bonet like this. And so to protect Patsy, he says he finds a blanket and lays it over her as he's done many times before when she's fallen asleep. So it's qu quite a nice little touch there to sort of say, you know, in death he covers her over with a blanket because, you know, it's the sort of gesture of a, of a kind father, a father who takes care of his child, a father who, um, you know, tries to keep his child warm kind of thing. And um, what's also interesting is, and we'll get to it in another narrative, is that another clothing item was actually found on John Bonnet as well, besides this this blanket. Let's just go to where Linda Oren talks about John doing that. John Ramsey came back into the living room, and he grabbed a throw that was on the back of a chair, and he says, can we please, could you please cover her body? And as he's saying it, he's already put the blanket on top of her. Now the irony of all this is in the first phase of the Rams investigation, when I say that I mean the first couple of years, the defense was sort of, well, you know, there's no way you could prove anyone did this because the crime scene was contaminated. When that phase sort of passed, sort of kind of fairly inconclusively, although there was actually the grand jury indictments, um, which were not, I guess, formalized by the district attorney. Then it went from that to, no, there's definitely um, unambiguous DNA from this unknown male donor. And we'll deal with the DNA narrative in, a, in, a, in, an, in its own episode. I really want to deal with that before the, the next Ramsey Apology documentary on, I think it's the 4th of January. I want to deal with the DNA myth and the DNA narrative. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is the, um, the contradiction between first the crime scene is too contaminated to know what to do with it. Then, then it becomes, oh no, it was definitely an intruder and it's definitely an individual intruder because he has our DNA. And it's so unambiguous, well, who cares? There was no contamination. This case hinges on a DNA profile, and that is going to be the what uh, solves this case. And it's just absolutely ridiculous given the crime scene, given what is going on there. And in the same way, the Madeleine McCann case isn't a DNA case. It's a circumstantial evidence case, and to some extent, um, it's got to do with other things as well, like cadaver alerts and the whole mosaic. I'm not going to go much further through the narrative. It's what sort of happens after that is that um, Patsy sort of enters the room and then there's sort of a lot of hysteria. Everyone's praying. Um, the reverend sort of, you know, starts talking about merciful savior. And um, John says he, he blanks out. And um, next thing, Father Roll performs the last rites for John Bonet and Patsy's wailing and Linda Oren talks about this terrible sound, this terrible moaning that comes from Patsy and she's screaming, Jesus raised Lazarus, please raise John Bonet kind of thing. And so it's this crazy scene that is playing out. Um, Linda Oren wants backup, you know, uh, and apparently a, 
ambulance um, sort of thunders by or sort of streams by outside going to the wrong address so it's it's kind of um, a lot of um, mishaps kind of going on at the same time father roll put his arm around patsy and um, john says his body is numb like a stick and i find that quite a interesting thing that's going on here is john benet is dead john benet is cold john benet is stick like and he's saying well that's how he feels his body is numb he's, he's like a stick and yet the way that other people found John that morning was that he seemed, or that day, is that he seemed cordial, that he seemed, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to put it. He seemed almost matter of fact. And he would then call his pilot to arrange, he was going to leave, you know, John Bonet's body is found and he was going to then fly out of there, but he would deal with that somewhere else. Um, he says, I want to be with her, I'd rather die. And and then that, and that, that's sort of where this part of the, the narrative ends. This is from page 22 and uh, the top half of page 23 in Death of Innocence. Now we're going to go to the next narrative, which is uh, Steve Thomas's book, John Bonet, Inside the Ramsey Murder Investigation. And we're going to kind of deal with the next phase of this and then also deal with the type of wounds John Bonet suffered, quite um, extensive injuries, not just to her neck or to her head, but to other parts of her body as well. But before we get to that, I want to say sayonara to those folks on YouTube. Again, if you want to watch the full episode, you need to head to Patreon. It's on the $2 tier. That's Patreon slash TCRS. There are also 13 audiobooks on Patreon on the $5 and $10 tiers. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time. She had trauma to her vagina. Vagina.